Welcome to Hope Unveiled, the podcast that guides you on a transformative journey toward a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ. We are Sunrise Church of Surrey, British Columbia, Canada, and our mission is to carry the hope and purpose of Jesus to those who may feel far from God. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the teachings of Jesus, offering practical insights and guidance for your faith journey. Whether you're taking your first steps in faith or seeking to deepen your existing relationship with Christ, we invite you to join us on this journey to embrace the hope that transforms lives. I want to ask you a question. Why are you here? Why are you here? I believe that after today, you'll understand why you're even alive and what you're supposed to do in life. And I was going to title this message. This message would be called Mission, but I almost really feel like I'm not an expert on the mission. This is the process of the making of a disciple, and it involves you. And I could say, for those of you who know me, the best, I work hard. I'm a hard worker. I've always worked hard. As an athlete, as a coach, as a student, and now as a minister of the gospel, I have to tell you that ministry is probably one of the hardest things by far compared to all those things. It's hard because I'm still a coach. I'm still a student. And I'm called to be a minister of the gospel in all of those environments. Just like you might be doing a job that might not be related to being a professional Christian. But you're still a minister of the gospel everywhere you go. But I'm not here to tell you how hard I work, and I'm not here because of any of that great work. I'm not here because of my great grades, and I'm not even here because of my great faith. I'm here because of God's great love and the great work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Yeah. But the other reason why I'm here is because somebody, somebody just like you, shared that message with me, shared that message with Lonette, my wife. And it changed my life forever. So I want to thank you, Sunrise, for continuing to make me a disciple, to make each other disciples. I want to thank ACOP for what they put in, the heart and passion that they put in to this mission. I want to thank Chris, Pastor Chris and Sherry. I want to thank so many people from back in the day at Relate Church when you were the very people that showed me and Lonette what it was like to follow Christ and prophesied this moment more than a decade ago, which was hard to believe, but it's here. And I want to thank Marshall, a young man of God who was a seed planner in my life when we worked at the BC Lions and I was an adult doing work as a strength coach and he was just serving as a water boy and did everything in sight, but yet he would share his faith with me, share the gospel with me when I didn't even know what it was. He is a youth leader now at SC Youth and very influential still in my life. I want to thank you. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew 28. We are in a series of undivided, and we've been learning about the way of love with an undivided heart towards Jesus and his church. And today I get to continue with that undivided sermon series with what it means to serve the mission. What is the mission? This is something that you will learn. What is your mission? And what is your place in this mission? And to do that, we will be teaching you from the Bible. And a lot of you know what the Bible is, and many of you might not be familiar with the Bible. 
The Bible is divided into the Old Testament and it's divided into the New Testament. That is formatted into books, chapters, and verses. The Old Testament is the first part of the Christian Bible that tells us about the Jews, their history, and God's words, words to them in the time before Jesus Christ was born. And the New Testament is the part of the Bible that deals with the life and the teachings of Jesus Christ and with the Christianity in the early church. And today, we'll be in the New Testament book of Matthew and a little bit in the Old Testament. So at this time, I would like to invite SC Youth, Paul De La Serna for the reading of today's scripture. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. And we thank you that you say in your word that once your word goes out, it always accomplishes what it was intended to do. So Lord Jesus, penetrate the hearts and minds of those who are listening and make a change in their life. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Bruce F. Hunt, a missionary wrote an article in 1957. He said, the work of the church is missions. It's not primarily self-preservation, the perfection of organization and equipment, the improvement of membership, or several other firsts that people might propose. First and foremost, the church is about mission. That's why we exist. That is who we are. We are a people on mission. I want everyone to just shake out, their, shake out your voices and your bodies and say, I have a mission. Let's go. Yeah, shake it out one more time. Let me hear you a little bit louder. I have a mission. I have a mission. Let's go. Wake it up. You guys have been sitting a long time, and I really appreciate that. But whether it is a local mission national mission or global we have a mission but how do you define the word mission and i looked up mission in the dictionary webster's dictionary and it basically says this it's ascending being sent or delegated by authority and it comes from a latin root it means to be sent as a delegate Persons sent a number of persons appointed by authority to perform any service, particularly the person sent to propagate religion or evangelize. This is an old source. I looked up a really old source. Evangelize the heathen, it says. Wow. Okay. But Avery Willis, an author and missiologist, he describes the mission this way. He says, by mission, I mean the total redemptive purpose of God to establish his kingdom. Missions, on the other hand, is the activity of God's people, the church, to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God in the world. Missionaries are the ones being sent. And missional describes a mission-shaped life. And when we talk about mission, we're talking about the proclamation of the gospel, the good news to all people in all places. So in order to like get into this mission mindedness or this mindset of uh, mission, missional, I believe that we have to first have this belief or this understanding that the Bible does teach and encourage and equip us for missions. 
So I want to look at what the Bible says. And when we look at missions, every time I hear the word missions, my mind directly goes to, well, it actually first <laughs> goes to uh, Chuck Norris and like um, missing in action. But clearly my mind needs a bit of renewal. But it also goes right to the New Testament, Matthew 28. And we may think of missions as just a New Testament idea that was introduced to us by Jesus. But when I was given this assignment to preach about the topic of mission, my study took me deeper into going a, a little bit more into the Old Testament and to get more familiar with what the Old Testament was revealing about missions. And it led me to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12, where it says this, the Lord said to Abram, this is before his name was changed to Abraham. So it's Abraham, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and in and him who dishonors you, I will curse. <clears throat> and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. I see mission written all over this. The Abrahamic covenant in Genesis was not just about God blessing Israel as a people. This is a promise of God blessing all the nations of the earth and God using Abraham and his seed to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. God clearly had a plan here. So the Old Testament is not just about Israel being blessed and then sitting on their blessing while the whole rest of the world just withers away. It was for Gentiles like us, people who are non-Jews. It was for us. The blessing to Abraham is a blessing to the Jewish people, but through the Jewish people and to us. So it is clear, and I just want to make this point, that from the beginning, God has a mission. God has always been on mission. God's plan from the beginning was mission. And God's plan involves you and me on mission. And that's why Jesus came. Jesus had a mission. He was sent on mission. And the mission of Jesus is still the mission of the church, people of God. Jesus was sent by the Father to seek and save the lost, as it says in Luke 19.10. Clearly, Mission is important to God. But let me ask you this. Is what's important to God important to you? Is mission important to you? What is mission? What is it? Basically, the mission is to make disciples. And us, all of us together, the church has been sent into a spiritually broken world to proclaim the good news of redemption that can only be made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins. And just as God sent Jesus on this mission, he now sends each and every one of you on this same mission. It says in John 17, 14 to 16, Jesus' words, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them. He's talking to his disciples. <clears throat> in John 20, 21, Jesus said to them again, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And we respond to this calling by first following Jesus, loving him with all our hearts, all our minds, all our souls, and all our strength, and then becoming his fishers of men, as it says in Matthew 4, 19. But when we neglect the calling to make disciples, we neglect the mission of God and sees being a church who is truly following Jesus on his mission. And since we as people of God can't save anybody, believe me, I've tried. And I'm sure there's a lot of you who are trying to save me too. It's a failing mission. We can't save anybody. So we direct people to the chief shepherd, 
Jesus Christ, the only one who can save. And we carry that hope wherever we go. This is at the heart of what we're called to do as Christians. And Matthew 28 defines our purpose. It establishes our mandate. So for anybody who has walked in these doors or anybody who is watching this video online who might have woke up today and not sure of your purpose, if you are a believer in Christ, this is a message about your entire purpose, your mission in life, and it should shape everything that you do. But let me ask you this. If Jesus showed up right now and called you to a meeting, would you go? Put up your hand. Would you go to this meeting? Because this is what's happening in this passage right here. Jesus died on the cross. Everyone saw it. He was buried in a tomb. Everyone saw it. Three days later, the tomb is empty. He's walking around resurrected, and he's calling this meeting. He calls his 11 disciples, and they proceed to Galilee to attend this meeting. You're like, I don't even know if I believe that. There was 500 more people there to witness this as well. These are all facts historically. But he invites us to this meeting as well. So let's find out what the risen Lord expects of us. So this meeting starts off a lot like how our meeting today started off. We started off in worship. We started off recognizing God for who he is, for what he has done, and trusting him in what, we will, what he will do in the future. But we're told that some in this meeting it says here, yeah, and when they saw him, they worshipped him. It's a worship service. And then we're told that some were doubtful. There were people that had questions. They weren't fully convinced. I, I'm like, wow. You have this, you see this man killed a few days ago, and he's walking around in front of you, what more is it going to take to convince you? Like, what is going on? That's what I can't figure out. But they still, they had questions. And it's very possible that one of you, one of us has questions. That you're not fully convinced. Is this Jesus thing real? Is, are these stories in the Bible real? I have questions. The crazy thing is the more I go into the Word of God, the deeper I go, the more questions I get. And that's okay to have questions. Keep leaning in. Jesus steps up to the pulpit and says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. You know, the word for authority, the choice of words that he uses is actually a pretty interesting one. Now, normally authority, power, dunamis is usually the dominant word for authority. It means dynamite, explosive power. But the word that Jesus uses in this passage is actually a little bit different. And, it, and it, the word is actually, and I want to pronounce this right, excusia. Excusia, but some say ecusia. It's different than dunamis. And I want to use an example from one of my favorite chaplains, former chaplains in the NFL, Tony Evans. He says this to describe this. He says, okay, you got a football team, and I'm former football coach. You have this football team. On one side, you have the players. These players are like, they're young. They're fast. They're strong. They're like my nephew, Keyshawn here. They're explosive. They have this physical ability. That's dunamis. But refs are usually a little bit older, a little bit weaker, maybe a little slower, maybe a little fatter. <laughs> Not all the time, but they're pretty in good shape. <laughs> they have excusia. See, the players can knock you down. They have that ability to just knock you down. But a ref 
can take you right out of the game. They have all authority. What they say goes. You can't even put your hand on a ref. You put your hand on a ref, you're out. They have all authority. Jesus said, I have all authority. And what he was saying to his men and what he is saying to us today is this. That there is no situation. There is no location. There is no community outside his authority and sovereign rule. I want you to think about that as he sends you into these communities or where you're called to go. He wanted us to understand that everything in heaven and on earth is under his control. And then Jesus issues a command. Make disciples of all the nations. And this is an imperative. For those of you who don't know what imper imperative means, it means that it's crucial. It is authoritative. This is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not a request. The whole point of the church is the making of disciples. And it's not merely the introduction of converts. But of course, dis disciples first start with making that decision to follow Jesus. But once you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you enter into the school of disciple making. Right. And at the heart of the mission is the reproduction in others of what Jesus has produced in us. Faith, obedience, growth, authority, compassion, love, and a bold, truthful message as his witness. We become like Christ. It says in Matthew 10, 25, that it's, it's enough for a disciple to become like his teacher and a servant like his master. And I can say that the direction that I've had from Pastor Braden, Pastor Chris, many of you who have actually pastored me, actually, to be honest, in order to even get up here to speak, you've fed into my life with positive feedback, constructive feedback, but all of it has been, I guess, directed to becoming more like Christ. A reflection of Christ. And I remember Pastor Braden quoted last time, uh, last Sunday, he says that the physical presence of the believer is the visible expression of Christ to one another. Ultimately, a disciple is a learner that is commanded to produce more learners. But then Jesus says, all nations. This can be challenging because Jesus is actually challenging the Jewish Christians to lose their prejudices and all of their preconceived notions. He's not saying just go to the Jews and the Jews alone. He's saying go to everybody, all nations all people groups, all different cultures, everybody. There's, we're supposed to minister impartially. But how do we now make disciples? How do we make disciples? Making disciples is the mission, but how do we do it? There are three parts to this mission. Partis they call them participles to making disciples. So I want to first look at the first one. Well, you have go, baptize, and teach are the three participles. Let's take a look at go. Go means go. <laughs> go means don't stay. Don't stay. Go public. Jesus said, Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand in Matthew 10, verse 6 and 7. As you go, proclaim that the Messiah is here. As you go about your life, say the Messiah, Jesus Christ, has been here in this body, in my life, in my marriage. What you're looking at is a byproduct of the work of Jesus Christ. He's been here. And Jesus also said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel, the good news to 
the whole creation. Does anybody know what the good news is? Put up your hand if you know what the good news is. This is, this is the question. Because if you're going to go out and tell people what the good news is, you kind of have to know what it is. <laughs> I mean, I never knew scripture uh, early on. I knew enough. I knew a little bit. And I just knew what God had done in my life. I knew it couldn't have been me. It couldn't have been me. I wasn't the one who restored my marriage. I wasn't the one to take myself out of the pit of addictions. It wasn't me. It's easy enough, even if you don't know everything, to tell people about that. But the good news is that through the love and work of Jesus, all who are far from him are brought near into his kingdom. Jesus saves us into a new life. He forgives our sins and heals us from brokenness, leading us by his spirit to follow him. Go, tell somebody, don't stay. You're not just here in church to be sitting here. You're here to be equipped and then go out and be representatives of the king to our culture. But can you say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel? Can you say that? I'm not ashamed of the gospel because this is the definition of the gospel right here in Romans 1, 1, 6. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. How many people have experienced the power of God in their life? Put up your hand. Can you just get a shout of praise, a five-second shout of praise, a praise break? How many of you experienced the power of God? Winning people to Christ is part of making disciples. So it's not only what you get when you come to church. It's actually the difference that you make when you leave. So I would say, get going. Get going. Going means more than traveling across geographical borders. But it does. Going means crossing the street. Going to dinner with an unbelieving friend. Going into the inner city to serve a place like Mackey's place. It means going beyond one's comfort zone to make Jesus accessible. Basically, living life is going with a purpose every day. You have a purpose. Every day you have a purpose. I'm going on this mission. I'm talking about this mission, about going. One hour after I leave here today, I'm going right to the airport. My bags are almost packed. So if I slip out really quickly, <laughs> I'm not packed quite yet. So the flight leaves at 4.30. And I'm going on a mission to Hamilton, Ontario, to be a representative of Jesus, to share the gospel throughout the entire week with a, with a company called Athletes in Action, the Grey Cup is in Hamilton, and they have a ministry that we're going to go into youth centers, remand centers, maximum securities, shelters, all kinds of different, I guess, organizations. And, and we're just going to share the gospel. We're going to share the hope of Jesus Christ. And why do I go? Because Jesus tells me to go. Because Jesus is the one sending me. Jesus is the one telling you to go, and Jesus is the one sending you. But I want to ask you this. As you go, are you looking for people and opportunities to share your faith? It's a very unique mission that you have, to just look for people to share your faith with. And there is a, a very good example of this in the Bible, when Jesus sends out the 72 in Luke 10. And I want to read a portion of, of this passage. You can put that on the screen. Luke 10, verse 1 says this, After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent him ahead of him, sent them ahead on ahead of him, two by two, into every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one along the road. <clears throat> this is the part that really caught me. Whatever house you enter, first say, peace be to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. But if not, it will return to you and remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide for the labor, laborer deserves his wages. Now, I used to look at that passage and all I could think about was that the harvest was plentiful and there's not enough workers because I'm out here working and I'm getting killed. Lord, please send more people to help with the work. And I was just so focused on me and I actually lost sight of the mission, which is actually looking for someone who is open to hear your message. But the first thing that stood out to me here is very encouraging, actually. There's a large group of followers. This is a reminder that there was a larger group of committed followers beyond the 12 disciples. And from among that large group, Jesus appointed and sent 72 to do his work. So what that tells me is this. You might not be a professional Christian. You might not work in the church as like a pastor, or you might not even see yourself as a minister, but you are. You might not be a part of that core group that belongs to a church and is like, you come in and you say hi to the pastors and the people who are ministry staff. You might be a part of that large group. The second part of that is where he himself was about to go. So when you go, when I go on this mission, take comfort that Jesus Christ, the Lord, is coming right after you. He himself was about to go. I, I heard Charles, I read Charles Spurgeon. He said, it's kind of like you can hear the sound of his footsteps behind you. Like imagine your master, your Lord and Savior, the one who you trust in. You're being sent out to go do something. You're not sure you can do it, but he is coming right behind you. This encourages me because wherever Jesus sends you, he is going with you. The person of peace. I never knew about the person of peace up until just a, not long ago. First, Jesus says that peace is something that a disciple carries. They were told to offer what they had, and they had that peace. They had that Jesus in them. They had that hope. They had faith. But as you go, are you looking for that person of peace? The person of peace was like the woman at the well spreading the good news that she received. The person of peace is the person who is open to you, hospitable, and welcomes you. Someone who is open to hearing your story, the good news, God's story, and someone who is faithful to share the story of what they heard. You know what? My brother-in-law is here, named Paul. And you might, yeah, Paul, let's go. But when I, when I read this, I actually thought of you because, well, one, it's taken a lot of forgiveness between you and I, and I've asked forgiveness, and it was some tough times, but yet you are this person that is open to hearing my message, open to hearing what God has done in our life, and you know what's crazy? I'll meet people that I don't even know. And they're like, yeah, your brother-in-law, Paul, told me about you. <laughs> what? It's a true story. Oh, yeah, man. Now he was this and that. And now he's, uh, yeah, he's like doing that Jesus thing and all that stuff. <laughs> but he, you're so welcoming and you're always so hospitable. You know, person of peace in the Jewish style is like a, a, a person was called a son of whatever they were like characteristic of. Like if you were like a good person or a peaceful person, you become a son of that thing. Son of peace. Son of peace. Thank you, Paul. Does anyone have a person like that? A person of peace? 
Are you a person of peace? Maybe you're not a believer yet, but you want to hear the message and you're like, tell me, I want to hear it. I want to hear more. Go. The second participle is of making disciples is baptizing them. Baptize them. Anybody baptize? Put up their hand. Baptism explains the new identity, identity classification, and we need to be reclassified, raised to new life. It's to say this, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Sunrise, our mission is to bring people to the point where they see themselves differently. Where they see themselves as like Jonathan said, the beloved. Loved and cherished by God. Baptism is that moment when you re-identify with the child of God. You are claiming your followership in Jesus Christ. Now, the third participle is teach them. To observe all he has commanded, to reflect, to manifest, to live out. So going to church is both awesome and critical. We get taught, we get equipped. Going to small groups is critical. Going to youth group is both fun and critical. Right, Sam? Right, Winner? Youth group is fun, but it's also critical. But it's most meaningful when it's actually applied. Teaching people about the ways of God is also part of your mission. I'd like to invite the worship team back up. It's always so much more spiritual when the worship's playing. Um, so I feel like I have to wait to get spiritual. But I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. Becoming a disciple maker or the process of disciple making. I want to leave you with three, three things, three practicals. Some of which I learned from J.D. Greer. Love J.D. Greer. Number one, own your mission. Own your mission. The key word there is your mission. This is your mission. And the common obstacle that happens or, or we almost make for ourselves is we think that God called someone else to this mission. I don't know enough. I'm not good at it. I'm not good at sharing my faith. Own your mission. Because your job, your job is making disciples. And I remember we had this sign up one of the years in at BC Lions, and it's probably up in a lot of sports teams, locker rooms. The sign said, do your job. I'm not gonna, do your job. <laughs> I'm gonna say it, do your job. I feel like sometimes God's telling me, do your job. But you know what? Jesus gave you that job. Jesus gave you that job. And he promises that he will actually do it through you. He doesn't say, become a fisher of men, then I will do the making. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow him and he will make you a fisher of men. Number two, understand the method. It's life on life. Even though Jesus preached, he taught, and this is very important, but it's about doing life with people, bringing them into what you're doing. The author Robert, Robert Coleman says, whether Jesus was addressing the multitudes that pressed upon him, arguing with the Pharisees who sought to ensnare him, or speaking to some lonely beggar along the road, the disciples were always close at hand to observe and to listen. One personal demonstration, one living sermon 
it is worth a, a hundred explanations. Live your life and as you go, as you go proclaiming your faith, live your life in faith. I could say that the earlier part of our Christianity was exactly that, life on life. The people that took us under their wing initially in the early part, took us to their home, we ate with them. We worshiped to lyrics on a TV screen. They prayed with us and for us. We studied the Bible and we just hung out and got to know each other. I feel like if you're watching this, I would love to mention every name, but there are too many. You know who you are and I, I am forever grateful for those moments of showing us what it was like to do life on life, that method. The third one, become a disciple, follow Jesus. Because you can't make disciples if you're not a disciple. Follow Jesus. So can we stand as we get ready to worship? One last prayer before we go on a six-day mission. Lord Jesus, make us fishers of men. Make us your disciples by your spirit, Lord. Teach us by your word, Lord. Guide us. Be a light to our path, a lamp to our feet, Lord Jesus. Guide us. We follow you, Lord Jesus, and we worship you. We worship you. We give you everything, Lord Jesus. Thank you for listening to Hope Unveiled. If you're interested in learning more about what you heard today, or if you would like us to pray for something specific for you, we invite you to connect with us on our website, sunrise.ca.